All right, and joining us today is veteran NHL player, over a thousand NHL games played, the first Senators captain in franchise history, Laurie Boschman. Laurie, how are you doing today, sir? Very good, Kyle. Uh, it's good to be with you. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Things things are good in your neck of the woods. Everyone's safe, happy, healthy. Uh, for the most part, yeah. Uh, I, I think everyone's looking forward to you. We're at the point now where they're talking about vaccines in the new year. So I think uh, people are probably pretty excited about that. Uh, everyone would like to get back to what our old normal was. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, after nine months uh, dealing with sort of the uh, the COVID and, and the pandemic, I think we're getting used to our new normal. And uh, that's, that's why probably we're uh, exercising this kind of format because Zoom is... Uh, is a way for people to connect and talk and uh, communicate. So it's a, it's a great, uh, uh, it, it's a great tool for that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. People are getting definitely creative in, in terms of how they're, you know, not only celebrating Thanksgiving and you know the holidays coming up and all that, but just even connecting with one another there. We were just saying offline, it, you know, had we known about zoom pre pandemic there, we should have uh, bought some stock in it, but uh, <laughs> what can you do? Right. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, growing up for you, you know, what was it always hockey uh, as your sort of first love or were you sort of a multi-sport athlete or uh, how did you first get introduced to the sport as a kid? Yeah, so uh, Kyle, I was a multi-sport athlete. My, um, uh, I sort of gravitated to hockey. It was the, it was the uh, was the sport I, uh, I, 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 I um, you know, was a little bit more passionate about. But uh, you know, growing up, I'm a, uh, born in Saskatchewan, and of course, for the first nine years of my life uh, living there, uh, the weather is a little bit more conducive in the prairies uh, to uh, playing hockey, and there was five uh, kids in our family, so we were outside all the time. Uh, you know, running, jumping, playing, wrestling, doing something, right? Uh, I played soccer, basketball, uh, hockey. I did not play football. That's one sport I did not play. But uh, we were just a real active family, and I was very active. But uh, when I was uh, six years old, my dad uh, brought home some hockey equipment, and that's really kind of how I started. I, I learned to skate uh, on the outdoor arena, and I was living at that time in a town called Bengoff, Saskatchewan, which is down um, in southern Saskatchewan near the Montana border. And, um, you know, it was just cold in the winter and you, you know, you just skated outside with your, with your buddies, you learned to, to do that. And then we, we ha had a rink in town, the town we lived in was only 600 people. So um, the, we didn't have artificial ice. So we had to wait till it got cold enough uh, in November for the parents to put ice in and they put ice in. And so I, I played hockey as long as there was ice in that rink. And then when I was nine years old, my parents moved from Saskatchewan East to uh, Brandon, Manitoba. And so that's where I sort of uh, got engaged a little bit more in informal hockey because Brandon at the time was a town of about uh, 25,000. So I went from a town of 600 to a town of 25,000. So, uh, you know, that was a, a big jump for me as a nine-year-old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Going to the, the booming metropolis of Brandon, Manitoba there. <laughs> That's it. So, I, I mean, growing up then, what, what, what came first? You know, pond hockey, ball hockey, or, or, you know, skating on an actual rink for you then? Um, I think uh, uh, it was outdoor hockey and then, and then sort of... Uh, you know, the hockey that had a, it, it did have a cover over it, obviously. Um, and uh, it, it, so, so that's really, uh, I, I mean, it's not much different. I mean, outdoor hockey, we played it as kids, uh, you know, we put our skates on and did all that kind of stuff and, you know, our feet froze and did, did all that stuff. But I, I think, I think we did that uh, uh, living in the West end of Ottawa. We used to manage a, a rink here for the community uh, and, you know, our kids did it, our boys did it, and we did it actually. <laughs> and uh, it's just a, a very Canadiana thing to do. Um, but yeah, it's, it started out playing outdoor hockey and then getting a little bit more organized. Not until I was nine years old, we moved, uh, you know, to, to Brandon, Manitoba. Then it was uh, indoor and outdoor hockey. I played uh, in, in the West End of Brandon with the West End Community Center. So I was a part of an outdoor league. And, you know, back in the day, uh, you know, in Brandon in the, uh, so that would be, uh, let's see now be 69. Uh, so late sixties, early seventies, they never, uh, we were three blocks away from West end community center and they never, uh, uh, had, had the devices to clean off the, uh, uh sidewalks. So people just would walk up when it snowed, they'd walk on the sidewalks and, and, uh, and, they'd have so many people, we live near Brandon University and they'd have so many people walking on the sidewalks that 
that it really compacted the snow so much so that I could stay home, put my skates on and skate the three blocks on the sidewalk to West End Community Centre. And then my I play hockey for several hours with uh, my friends and everything like that. And there was a league on the weekend that I was involved with and my parents took me to that. But then I would skate back home and my feet were frozen and, you know, my toes were frozen. And then I'd, I'd come home and, you know, as a, you know, as a, as a 10, uh, 10, 11 year old, I'd be crying because my, my feet were just on fire once they thawed out, you know, my toes. Right. So you know, those are some great memories, but that's sort of how I, you know, uh, because there was a lot of, uh, you know, cold weather and, and it was just the weather was conducive to playing outdoors. Um, I, I did that. I, I played baseball too. And I, I was on the, you know, on the basketball team and I played volleyball and all those kinds of things. So I was, uh, I was very, um, you know, interested in athletics and, and, and multi-sport and all that kind of stuff. But I, I sort of excelled at hockey and, and uh, I guess that was uh, my first love. Yeah. So, I mean, growing up, any Canadian kid who plays hockey dreams of, you know, playing in the NHL and making yeah. it big. And, but I, I'm always curious as well, too, you know, growing up, if it wasn't going to be hockey, what was sort of your, your other dream? It was it a policeman? Was it a firefighter? Like, what was sort of the, uh, the, the young Laurie's uh, vision of the future for himself there? Yeah, well, you know what? It's 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 really uh, kind of uh, narrow narrow minded on, on my part. Uh, I I didn't have a plan B, <laughs> and uh, it was always you know like again like you're saying, Kyle. Just as a kid, if you like a sport, you might think, okay, well, I really like basketball, and like the Raptors just won the championship last year, and maybe I'd like to, you know, play on in the NBA, be a you know a, a, a Raptor or you know, you have a favorite team player and, and so it's not unusual for people to do that, whether it's soccer, baseball, all those kinds of things, right? Cause uh, there's a lot of Canadians now playing major league baseball and, and uh, you know, in the NBA, there's some very good basketball players coming uh, right across the country. So I think it's like that for young people. And, you know, that's what it was for me. My dad was a, a big Boston Bruin fan and therefore the, I was as well. And, um, and so then I, I liked hockey, excelled at it, all my friends played it. So we were always kind of into that hockey mode. And then we were collecting hockey cards. And, you know, back in the day, uh, they had this SO power play. And we always used to, when my, when my dad needed to fill up with gas, you'd go to SO. And so it, it's a brilliant marketing scheme because, uh, you know, I'd always be bugging my dad because you buy this book for like three dollars and then it had, you know, all the teams in the L and every time you go and fill up, they'd give you a couple of packages of little cards. And then you'd 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 get those cards, you'd get, uh, uh, you, you know, Bobby or Phil Esposito, whatever you put them in, in the book and then you'd trade with your buddies at school. So it was always kind of like there was always a hockey theme going on. And uh so unfortunately, I did not have a plan B, which, uh, you know, raising three boys, uh, you know, their mother and I would always say, boys, you got to education, 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 you know, post-secondary education, because, you know, after I played junior hockey, um, you know, I, I finished grade 12, uh, I got drafted as an underage, you know, as an 18 year old, and the next year I'm playing in the NHL. And so... You know, my, my, my kids were always, well, dad, you didn't do it. Well, it's because it was different back in the, mm -hmm. in the seventies and, you know, in, in the nineties and the two thousands and, uh, you know, nowadays you, you, education is important. So, you know, to answer your question, unfortunately, I didn't have a plan B and I wouldn't suggest that for anyone listening to this who has kids, but, um, uh, it, it, I was just very fortunate that it did work out for me that I was able to make a living and do something, you know, in the game, but I did not have a plan B. So I often think I would maybe be in sales at some level um, because I like people and uh, I, I think I'm reasonably good at, uh, at sales. So I'd probably be selling something. 
So you so you already touched on it that you made the move over to Brandon and you got hooked up with the Brandon Wheat Kings there for your junior career. And you guys end up forming one of the highest scoring and most productive lines in all of major junior hockey with yourself and Brian Prop and Ray Allison there. And what, what was it, do you think, that led to so much success on the ice there and allowed you guys to get such quick chemistry together? Yeah, yeah I think... Uh... You know, we were very fortunate that we had a very strong team there in Brandon. Uh, Dunk McCallum was our coach. He was a former NHL defenseman with the Pittsburgh Penguins, and he, uh, um, you know, they they brought together quite a quite a good collection of players uh, during the you know the two years that I played in Brandon. And there was a, a player by the name of Billy Durlego who had played um, uh, uh, with the Brandon Wheat Kings, and and he was. Um, playing with Brian Propp and Ray Allison. And then he got drafted in the 1977 draft, I believe by the uh, Vancouver. Cubs. I think he might've been fourth or fifth overall. And so then uh, I was playing with the team as a rookie. And so they, they put me the next uh, year in between uh, Brian and, and Ray. So uh, they had already been playing for a couple of years with the, the Brandon Wheat Kings and they were very good players. Um, uh, Brian uh, Prop was a left winger and he was more of a goal scorer. Ray Allison was, uh, our right winger and and uh, you know he could sort of muck and grind and that but he he had a, a the ability to score too and and part of my job was to just to try and set both of those guys up and then I didn't mind uh, I didn't mind fighting and and all that kind of stuff so we all you know sort of had had a specific role we played and and back in the 70s in the Western Hockey League Kyle there was a lot of fighting so uh, you know that was uh, that was a real part of the game uh, intimidation and all those kinds of things. And so we had a very strong team uh, uh, and we had a very tough team as well. So uh, those two, two factors help. I think my last year junior, uh, when I got drafted as, a, as an 18 year old, I think uh, we only lost eight games out of a 72 game schedule. So all that to say is we had a very skilled team. So I think, I think the combination is, is we brought different things to the table and and I think the number one thing was is is that uh, we, we had uh, some better talented players collected with the Brandon Wheat Kings at that time than other teams did, and and we just uh, you know we all had the same goals. We wanted to win the Memorial Cup, and and uh, so uh, I, I think those those factors you know were uh, were you know uh, were why we were successful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and you know did it make it extra special for all all three of you guys to ultimately end up getting drafted into the nhl and you know going in, in I, I believe you also went in the same draft class as well didn't you yeah we all we all were first round picks uh i got picked by toronto uh ray allison uh, or brian prop i think was next i think he got picked uh, by the philadelphia flyers mm -hmm. then uh Brad McCrimmon was our, our our top defenseman. He got picked by the Boston Bruins, and then uh, Ray Ellison got picked by the Hartford Whalers. So we had we had four players, um, you know, picked in the first round of a twenty one team uh, league at the at that time in in nineteen seventy nine. So uh, I think that just uh, uh, was indicative of the fact that we had some skilled players, and and we were quite strong group and and uh, you, you know those four individuals uh, or three other individuals all had you know fairly substantial NHL careers which uh, you know is indicative that they were uh, pretty good players mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I mean leading up to the draft there for yourself at least did you have sort of a, a vague idea of about where you would go or who you would go to uh, just with the, you know pre-draft conversations and that with teams or was it just as big a surprise to you when you heard your name called by the Leafs as it was to, you know, the, the viewing public at home. Yeah. So, so what had happened, uh, Kyle, in 1979 and, and uh, uh, you, you're uh, probably not uh, old enough to remember, but they had uh, what they called the, the rival world hockey association. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and in 1979, the year I was drafted and, and uh, you know, my teammates were drafted uh, they ended up having um, uh, a draft over the telephone. Of course, we didn't have technology like we do today. And uh, uh, the NHL went from a 17-team league to a 21-team league. And the NHL absorbed uh, the Winnipeg Jets, the Hartford Whalers, Quebec Nordiques, and um, 
uh, at Edmonton, Winnipeg, Hartford, Quebec. Mm -hmm. So those four teams joined the NHL to make it a 21 team league. So as a result of that, they didn't have what you have today where you see, they bring you into, you know, the Montreal forum and every, you know, the, the families and agents and all the stuff. And the, the, the kid gets, uh, you know, called and he walks down, gets a Jersey. So we didn't have that. So, um, uh, in 1979 as well, um, after we lost in the Memorial Cup, we uh, went to the Memorial Cup and lost to the Peterborough Peets in overtime, uh, went home. And in, in the summer of 1979, the world was getting, the hockey world was getting ready for the uh, 1980 Lake Placid Olympics. Uh, so that's the, uh, the one where the Americans won. They call it the Miracle on Ice. They made a movie about it and stuff. The Americans beat the Russians and stuff. And so the, the, all the hockey world was getting there and they used amateurs back then, uh, unlike today. Uh, where they use uh, professionals. Now, uh, again, the, the last Olympics, they used amateurs because they couldn't uh, work things out with, uh, with the NHL. But uh, uh, I guess the next Olympics is in China. And I, I think uh, it hasn't been stated yet, but uh, I, I think the players uh, would like to play um, uh, in the, like the NHL players would like to play so that they can play in the Olympics. But, uh, I think that yet, uh, you know, remains to be seen if that's going to happen. But, but back, uh, back in our day, they used the amateurs. So when I got back from, uh, from, uh, from the Memorial cup, I got a call from hockey Canada and said, they said their training camps in Calgary. So they'd like me to try out for the Olympic team. So long and short of it is, as I went to Calgary, along with, uh, uh, many of the players that played there. Uh, that ended up playing for the uh, Canada's Olympic program uh, in uh, in Lake Placid in in uh, I think it was uh, January of 1980, and uh, so while we were there, they told us that uh, you know that uh, I you know I would be drafted, and so there was another player by the name of Paul Reinhardt. Uh, he has a couple sons that played in the NHL, and one that still plays with uh, I believe Buffalo. And so they told us that we would get drafted in the first round. And, and so anyways, uh, we had two days going at that particular time in Calgary. And so we went downstairs uh, at the basement of the, uh, uh, of the uh, rink in Calgary, of the Calgary Corral. And uh, we had an official there from uh, Hockey Canada. And there was a big phone there. And, and the deal was is when the phone call came, uh, you know, we get drafted and they tell us who it is. And so the phone rang and, uh, and it was uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs. And they said, Laurie, Laurie, it's for you. And uh, so I talked to Harold Ballard was the owner at the time. And I talked to him and, and Floyd Smith was the coach and, and Punch Imlek was the general manager. So those individuals I talked to and, and then, uh, um, you know, I mean, it was uh, Kyle, it was a dream come true. Uh, I, I, I knew, who all the players were in the NHL because I'd be collecting their hockey cards and trading them at school and, you know, watching hockey on Saturday night with my dad and all those kinds of things. So, you know, I was, uh, I was very up on all these players and to, you know, to get drafted by Toronto was a dream come true. Now I would have loved to have got dra drafted by the Boston Bruins because they were my favorite team, but uh, uh, I think Boston was quite fortunate. They picked Ray Bork two picks ahead of me, and I think they're glad they did that. So uh, that, that worked uh, out all right for them, I suppose. Exactly. There. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, and then Paul Reinhardt got drafted a few picks later than I did. He got picked by the Atlanta Flames, which uh, a year later turned turned out to be the Calgary Flames. But uh, uh, so I had a decision to make. I had had to decide whether to. Um, continue with the uh, Team Canada experience and, and maybe go to the Olympics and then maybe turn pro after or I would leave Team Canada's training camp and then go and and, and try and you know be an NHL player and uh, I made a decision about a week later to, to leave Team Canada's training camp to get ready to go and try out in Toronto and uh, and it, it, it turned out well for me because I did make Toronto as an underage and then Paul Reinhardt decided to stay he went to the Olympics with uh, Team Canada I think they finished sixth uh, in the tournament and uh, then he turned pro with the Atlanta Flames after that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I mean we, we just had Rick Vive uh, former teammate of yours with Toronto on the show a few episodes ago there and he, he was describing his experience with sort of that 
early 80s late 70s Leafs there as you know it, it, it was an interesting franchise during some turbulent times during their their history there and what he had said was they had sometimes a tendency to put too much pressure on, on young players, whether it was rushing them to the league or uh, just unrealistic expectations. Uh, you know, do you feel like you were properly prepared when, when you made the jump from, you know, being a 18, 19 year old to, to the league? Or do you feel like you could have maybe done with another year of seasoning and whether it was the minors or keeping your amateur status there? Yeah, I mean, those are those are hard calls, Kyle, because I think most young players coming from junior, um, and, and and certainly I'm speaking today, um, they have a high degree of confidence that they can compete at that level, mm-hmm. and um, and and sometimes that plays itself out like that, but most times that's not the case because, you know, you have to realize that there's a lot of other top first and second round picks that are playing currently in the NHL <laughs> yeah. and, and, and it's like an all-star squad, right? Uh, that wasn't the case with me. I, I came to training camp and I was thinking I was so in awe of players like Daryl Sittler and Boris Salming and Ron Ellis and Tiger Williams and some of these guys that I watched on TV. Uh, I couldn't believe I was on the ice with these guys, let alone, uh, you know, meeting them. And uh, I remember Daryl Sittler, who was the captain of the team, he came to me during training camp and he said, uh, you know, hey, hey uh, kid, uh, you know, welcome to Toronto. I'm Daryl Sittler. And it's kind of like, yeah, I know who you are. You know, I didn't say that to him, but, and, and he said, uh, he said, just, uh, just do what you can, do what you did in junior to get drafted where you, where you did. And um, he said, you'll be fine. So ultimately, you know, you, you spend some time in Toronto and they, they inform you that, you know what, we've actually traded you, you're heading out west to Edmonton. What were your initial thoughts when you had first heard about the trade, especially being still so young in your career? Uh, of course, whenever you're traded, you're disappointed. I, I really liked playing in Toronto and it, it was, uh, uh, I, I had some great mentors there in the, uh, you know, and some of those players, Ron Ellis and, and Daryl Sittler, they, they really taught me, Kyle, what, uh, you know, how to be a pro and, and, and how to prepare and what to do. Um, I mean, Daryl Sittler was doing off ice training before off ice training was really the thing to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I learned what I had to do uh, to, to be a pro and then to stay as a pro because mm-hmm. uh, th- those are two important factors. So I was kind of disappointed, but um uh, you know, there was a, a lot of um, uh, uh, controversy. Um, Kyle, are you still there? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So uh, there was a lot of, sorry about that. There was a lot of controversy um, uh, uh, with me in Toronto. Uh, and, and so uh, it was, it, it was nice to get, get uh, traded and uh, and and to restart and again the Edmonton Oilers were a team that was just coming they were up and coming so it was uh, it was great to uh, to be able to play with those guys and uh, I, I just wish I could have experienced it uh, for a year longer because uh, I was only there for parts of two years and they won a Stanley Cup and I wasn't a part of it but uh, but then I got traded to Winnipeg and that's where things for me really uh, uh, turned the corner uh, with my career at that point so it, it turned out to be pretty good, uh, generally speaking. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, you, you just alluded to it right there, right? And, you know, you're playing with very young versions of Messier, Gretzky, Coffey, Fuhrer, the, the, the whole gamut of, of the Edmonton Oilers dynasties there. And, you know, did you guys have a sense, you know, even early on that that team and those players and all of them were going to have anywhere near the careers and success that they would have, or did you guys just enjoy the ride for what it was worth? Like, did, did you have an inkling of how special that group of individuals was? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think there was, uh, there was certainly a confidence there. Uh, no question because, you know, Gretzky was the, the best player in the game there. Uh, Messier was turning into a, a, a top player and they had, uh, you know, Glenn Anderson and Yari Curry and Paul Coffey and, and Grant Fuhr. And, you know, I think they've got seven Hall of Famers now. And I think as, you know, we were all in our early 20s 
and you realized and recognized, man, these guys, like we've got a good team and these guys are special players, but it, it took them a few years to learn how to win. And I think they learned a lot from losing to the Islanders and, you know, the Islanders won, you know, four straight Stanley cups and beat the, the Oilers one year. And I think they learned a lot through that. Uh, I think one of the, uh, one of the mentions, one of the takeaways that, that uh, Gretzky had mentioned, um, uh, I know that I had heard or, or read, he said, you know, after they lost out to the Islanders the last year that the Islanders won, won their fourth uh, cup, they went, uh, you know, past the Long Island dressing room after they had won the cup and there was guys all over the place with ice packs and bags and different things like that uh, all over the place and they realized what it takes to win. And uh, I think in a tournament like that in the Stanley Cup playoffs, you realize and recognize it takes an awful lot of teamwork to win. It takes uh, maybe, a, you know, some good or timely goaltending, some uh, good and timely uh, goals scored on in special teams. Uh, it, but it just takes it, it takes a lot of uh, a lot of talent and sometimes a little bit of luck in order, uh, you know, to, to achieve uh, those things. But, uh, you know, then they went on to win two Stanley cups and then lost to Calgary and, and won two more. And, and, and then they, uh, they ended up winning five in total. So, you know, I think uh, just by virtue of what they accomplished, they, uh, they demonstrated that they had a great group of players mm -hmm. and uh, they kept adding to those, uh, you know, to that strong team each year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for, for those that are watching the, the visual version of this here, we can see uh, right above your shoulder there, you've got the Winnipeg's Jets uh, painting behind yourself there. And you, you already mentioned it as well. You, you get traded to Winnipeg and that's sort of when everything started to really click offensively as far as, you know, your, your career going to the next level. What, what yep. was it, do you think, that you know, sort of clicked once you got to Winnipeg that allowed you to have such success on the ice? Well, uh, Kyle, one of the reasons I got traded from Toronto uh, and then to Edmonton was because uh, there was a lot of controversy at the time about my faith. And, you know, can a, a born again Christian play a physical sport like hockey? And I think, you know, and, and without getting into all the minutia of it, uh, I had said to Harold Ballard, Harold Ballard, the owner of the Leafs had made a, a big deal out of it in the newspapers and all that kind of stuff. And basically I stated that I thought it was Mr. Ballard's ignorance towards Christianity that he'd make a statement like that. And so uh, I wasn't playing well uh, at the time and it had nothing to do with my faith. Uh, I had come back from mononucleosis and I hadn't really gained my, um, uh, you know, my, my confidence back. And, mm -hmm. um, and then I wasn't playing a lot. And then they just uh, decided, well, this guy's got too much religion as they described it and they had to get rid of me. So uh, things were good in Edmonton, but uh, they, ha they had an injury. Messier went down with an injury and they traded me to Winnipeg for Willie Lidstrom, who won two Stanley cups with the Oilers, which I was, uh, I mean, Willie was happy because he was at the end of his career and he won two cups with the, uh, a very strong team and he was a big contributor with the Oilers. But uh, when I got to Winnipeg, John Ferguson was the general manager, John Ferguson senior. And, and he just said, uh, you know, Laurie, we just, uh, you know, don't worry about your faith. We're not concerned with that. We just want you to play. And so I think that's what really just sort of set everything at ease. And, uh, and uh, we had a very good team at the time too, Kyle. Winnipeg, McLean and Brian Mullen, we competed very well against, uh, you know, the Calgary's and the Edmonton's and stuff. And we could beat Calgary and LA and, uh, you know, those kinds of teams, but we just couldn't get through the Oilers in the playoffs. So, uh, so I played seven years there in Winnipeg and have a lot of uh, great memories, uh, you know, from my time there with the Jets. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you just said it right there is you guys had so much team success. You were making the playoffs pretty much every single year there, but just yeah. for, as the stars would align year after year, you would just seem to run into Edmonton and, and they would just have your number come playoff time. Right. Yeah. Well, you, you couldn't get out of the, you know, the Smythe division, the old Smythe division, you couldn't get out of there without, you know, beating Edmonton. You had to go through Edmonton, Calgary, uh, and, and uh, ourselves, or uh, or the LA Kings and Vancouver Canucks, we were, we we were the five teams in the Spike Division. So, you know, and it, 
was uh, obviously winning the cup and it wasn't the Oilers, it was Calgary or something like that. So, uh, so yeah, it was just very frustrating. And sometimes we could, you know, contain, uh, you know, uh, Gretz and, and mess a little bit, but then all of a sudden uh, Curry caught fire or Esatikinen or, or, uh, you know, Glenn Anderson or Paul Coffey or, you know, so, or, or Grant Fierce stood on his head and stopped, you know, 52 shots and they won six, five, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, it was just very, very frustrating uh, from a competitive point of view, but uh, looking back at it, they were just a juggernaut. And uh, oftentimes they, they said that some of the, you know, the hardest things for the Edmonton Oilers was to get out of the smite division. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, so other teams in the NHL were trying to emulate that that style because that's the style you have to play in order to to to, to win to, to win the Stanley Cup and to beat them. So uh, so yeah, I mean it was fun looking back, but no fun. Kyle getting knocked <laughs> out by the Oilers year after year. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean that's just it, right? No matter how you dress it up, losing stinks and it never feels good, right? Right. But, um. I guess you were in a unique situation too, because this is your former teammates, a lot of former friends on that team. Does that in a way make it tougher to to lose to them? Or does it make it easier to know that I know them, they're good guys. Yeah. You know what? Uh, I don't, I don't think losing ever uh, becomes uh, at least it shouldn't, if you're in a sport that pays you to win, yeah. uh, it, it should never, it should never be comfortable, even though you've got friends in, in, you know, across the way, uh, you're disappointed because you're with this, you know, group of 25 guys and you're trying to, you know, reach the same goal. And so, yeah, you're, uh, you're, you're not very happy. Uh, that's for sure. And, yeah. and you're not, and you're not glad they, they beat you. So yeah, <laughs> to, to put it mildly. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, you, you've now spent time with three different Canadian teams and we, we move later on into your career here and you actually end up playing a couple seasons in New Jersey. What are yep. just some of the, you know, takeaways from moving from a Canadian market to an American market there and what some of the differences are just in you know day-to-day life and maybe you don't get recognized walking down the street as much as you would like what's it like moving from a hotbed to uh, a different venue like that well I'll, maybe I can sum it up uh, with this story so I was um, our youngest son was born in New Jersey Jeffrey and uh, it was around Christmas, the second year we were there. I played two years in New Jersey in, uh, from 1990 to 92. So we, had, we lived in New Jersey for a year and a half. And we were playing at the time in the Brendan Byrne Arena, they called it, which was out near Giant Stadium, uh, where Giant Stadium is today, uh, off of Highway Number 3. And so um, we got babysitter. My wife and I went to uh, Nordstrom's and did some Christmas shopping. And I could go anywhere in, in uh, New Jersey, New York area, and nobody knew who I was. And we really liked that because it, you know, we never considered ourselves to be anything special. We were just, you know, people who our job, my job was playing hockey and I love playing hockey. And, you know, to me, it was no big deal. But um, so anyways, I'm out shopping uh, with my wife and we're at Nordstrom's and uh, we're at the jewelry counter and my wife is looking at some you know some some jewelry and stuff and she walked a little bit further down the 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 counter and there was a young girl in her 20s uh um behind the counter and she had a name tag on and I forget what her name is but I'll just say it was Kathy and and so uh, my wife uh, Nancy was saying oh I like that and I like that so I got Kathy's attention and I said Kathy could I see you know that ring and that ring underneath the the glass counter and she said sure and she she gave me a double take and and Nancy heard me talking to Kathy and so she started to walk you know from the far end of the counter down towards me and Kathy turned and said when Nancy got beside me she said are you Lori Boschman and my wife and I turned to each other and we started laughing and we said oh Kathy we're not laughing at you it's just that we've lived in New Jersey a year and a half and you're the first person who recognized <laughs> us or recognized me 
for playing for the Devils. And she said, oh, yeah, Mr. Boschman. She said, I'm a big fan. And she, you know, went on to talk about Scott Stevens and, and Kirk Muller and, and, and those kinds of things. So, yeah, we are actually, Kyle, we, we loved it in New Jersey because we were about on the seventh page of the sports page. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, like high school football got bigger prominence than the, than the New Jersey Devils. Um, and um, so we, we really enjoyed it. Uh, we loved playing. Lou Lamorello was very good. He treated us very well. Uh, uh, we, uh, and, and again, I, I, I played there, um, you know, and then got uh, picked up in the expansion draft by the Ottawa Senators. But then two years later, the New Jersey Devils won the Stanley Cup. So it seemed like, you, you know, if you get rid of Boschman, you're just about assured to win the Stanley Cup. Um, but anyways, it was a great experience. We really enjoyed it, our time in New Jersey. We had a good team there. We had, uh, you know, again, like Kirk Muller and, and um, you know, Shanahan and, and uh, uh, Scott Stevens and, and Johnny Mack. And, you know, uh, uh, Berkey was our goalie, Chris Terreri. And uh, those were the years that um, we, we lost to Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh won two two cups during that time and they beat us out and so anyways good very good experience we we had a uh, we have lots of good memories from our, our two years there in New Jersey yeah yeah so uh, along comes the expansion draft there and the Ottawa Senators ultimately end up selecting you and uh, not only do they select you but they also then make you the first captain in team history uh, right. how, sort of in the grand scheme of things how, how special is that in all of your sort of career memories being the first ever captain of an NHL franchise yeah I think it's I mean it's awfully uh, uh, it's awfully uh, uh, nice you're 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 humbled by that um, Kyle I had been an assistant captain on three of the other teams I, I played on and and uh, you know, I was one of the older players if you would when we came to Ottawa here there was uh, you know guys like uh, uh, you know, Brad Shaw and, and uh, Dougie Smale and myself and, and, uh, and uh, you know, Brad Marsh was here. And so you knew that probably in all likelihood, they would choose someone who was a little bit older to, you know, to be the captain. And so uh, it's always an honor when you're, you know, when they uh, decide that uh, somebody should wear a letter. Uh, but it was very difficult because, uh, you know, being with an expansion team that only wins what do we win 10 or 11 games that year yeah that 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 is it was just painful it was absolutely painful so yeah very very difficult uh, uh to to be uh, in that kind of situation a situation that i'd I, i'd never been in, in in my life and uh but we had some good guys um you, you know on on that team but uh you know, it, uh, it was uh, a lot different than, uh, you know, when they had previous expansions and they, uh, they opened up rosters for, you know, new expansion teams or like the, the Las Vegas, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Golden Knights, they, you know, the Ottawa Senators, uh, you know, paid $50 million for a new franchise as did Tampa in 92, 93. And, uh, that many years, years later, Tampa, uh, or uh, Las Vegas paid 500 million. Yeah. Uh, so I think they got 10 times better players, uh, <laughs> you know, th than they did in back in, in 92 uh, for the expansion draft. So, so uh, yeah, so, so it was, it was a good experience. So as you, as you put it in the, uh, you know, the whole context, I mean, we're still living in Ottawa. Uh, we love the city, but uh, that was my most difficult year out of the, 14 years that I played in the NHL um, just because we didn't win many games and uh, my career ended after that. And, um, you know, that's certainly not the way you'd like it to end, but uh, a lot of times we don't have, you know, we don't have uh, opportunities to change that. Right. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. And I, I mean, even though your, your career, your playing career at least is over at this point, you, you certainly remain very active in the hockey community and, and uh, the, the projects that you're doing. Uh, one of them is Hockey Ministries International that you've been very, right. very, you know, active with. For, for those that are listening who might never have heard of it, you know, what, what in a nutshell is HMI? Yeah, so Hockey Ministries International is a, a not-for-profit organization, and we um, uh, facilitate a variety of things across, actually, the, the hockey 
uh, world. Uh, we run hockey uh, schools, Kyle. Uh, there's sleepover hockey camps uh, in uh, eight countries. We have over 2,300 uh, boys and girls age 9 through 17 that come through our program. Um, uh, we're in Canada, U.S., Switzerland, um, Canada, U.S., uh, Switzerland, Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, Hungary, Ukraine, um, and uh, where else am I missing? I'm missing one other country. But uh, uh, our camps are sleepover, and you know we talk about passing, skating, shooting, puck handling, but also we talk about Bible-based principles. We talk about how the Bible is relevant to them as uh, you know as young people, and we uh, talk about stories that. Uh, that we may maybe experience that are helpful to us and how you can be uh, uh, a, a Christian and play hockey and what that might look like. And so we uh, do that. We also, um, we also have chapel programs, non-denominational chapel programs uh, in over uh, 40 different leagues with over 400 teams. And part of my responsibility is any interested players that would participate in a chapel program at the NHL level. That's what I do. So I, uh, I conduct a chapel program for interested players uh, with the Ottawa Senators and uh, at, over across the river with the Gatineau Olympics. And we have one, we have another colleague, um, Paul Huggins, who, who uh, is with Athletes in Action, who does the, uh, the Ottawa 67. So all three uh, sports franchise, uh, hockey playing franchises here in, in, in this community have a, a chapel program. So that, that's what we do in a nutshell. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, with COVID, uh, it, it, it's been a little bit different because right now there's no hockey, uh, yeah. Quebec league was the only league that was up, but now they've shut down. And so, uh, right now we're waiting for uh, hockey to open up a little bit more and, and nobody knows what's going to happen in, in 2021. And, uh, to the extent that it will or if it will so so yeah. we're in a holding pattern right now so yeah yeah you you and the rest of the world there it seems for sure yeah uh for those that are interested in you know learning a little bit more about <laughs> hmi though where, where's the best spot for them to go to either get more information or to possibly learn about a, an upcoming event or something like that sure uh kyle thanks they could go to uh, of course triple w hockey ministries uh that's plural dot o-r-g so www.hockeyministries.org, or they could call uh, me on, uh, you know, at my office uh, at 613-698-5596. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, the office number, and we could provide any information, but they could go online and, uh, and get any information that, it, that, that anyone, uh, you know, needed on, uh, online. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, Laurie, thank you so much for sitting down with us and talking a little bit of hockey and, and your career and everything. And uh, like you say, we, we wish you guys all the best. And hopefully 2021 is a, a little bit more friendly to the sports scene and allows us to do a couple more things there. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, many people, uh, I think everybody is looking forward to getting back to the old normal. Yeah, that's absolutely. for sure. But no, it's been nice. Uh, it's been nice being with you. Nice talking to you, Kyle.